Rock The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the AFC East Roundup Podcast. I'm your host, Bill, season ticket holder, Drew Gear. That's my producer, Chris Krueger. Joining us for the program tonight is Mr. Elf Artiaga from Three Yards Per Carry. And we're here talking about, and it's the most timely conversation you can have, and it's the best time to have it, the AFC East quarterback situation, both now and looking forward into the future. Now, I want to start this, Elf, by saying this. I'm holding an envelope in my hand. Right here is an envelope full of Chris's hard-earned U.S. American dollars that he is now giving to me. Why don't you open it up and show it to him? And I've, I like what I like is that he's written seasons on the front of it. As if I need to know what's in, like I'm going to forget. And he also <laughs> sealed it like I'm an old lady who's going to open it up and lose what's in here. I sealed it at the tip. So... He has given me a whole bunch of 20s as if he thought he was going to the strip club. And this is him paying for his share of our 2024 season tickets for the Buffalo they Bills. Do have, they do have checks in Buffalo, right? <laughs> and this is – Chris doesn't believe and Cash App and PayPal. Like those things are really convenient. You know that, right? Chris does not believe in that. He's old school. He likes cash. And I think that he also why like not, gets- why not silver medallions or, <laughs> or quarter gold bars? I should have told him I'll only accept wampum. You gotta go in find fact, it. In fact, like uh, I'm just gonna venture to guess a uh, Buffalo season ticket costs one seat, right? It's one seat. Yeah, guess our pretty thirty six hundred bucks. Do I get do I got it right? For one seat? Yeah. <laughs> Chris, our season ticket cost was seven hundred and fifty dollars. Oh, okay. So you guys are oh, oh, so you guys you guys are lower level. I thought you guys were a little higher level. You were, we're higher so level. The- That's the best part. We are higher level. Welcome to Buffalo, baby. You guys down there in Miami Gardens, you can't you can't even fathom to guess. Okay, because I'm gonna tell you I'm gonna tell you where an end zone seat what an end zone seat is running a dolphin season ticket holder right now. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Remember they they're playing eight home games this year, okay? Yep. So it's ten. All right, end zone C is four thousand six hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, we're in the second so, level so, of the end zone. Hey, but Elf, everyone's so it's four hundred four hundred and sixty dollars per game. But Elf, don't tell Ask the- me if I would pay four hundred and sixty dollars a game to watch the seventy two Dolphins play. <laughs> no. The, the, but, but you know how much it cost me to watch them watch the Dolphins play and then watch everybody in the NFL play here in my house? Absolutely nothing. Well, about the 200 bucks I can spend on the finest food and booze I can find. For well, Sunday. that's it, right? And then you get the Sunday ticket like I used to. And if you, I'm sure you do, you have as well, in which case you will also and apparently be entitled to reparations <laughs> when they settle this whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> Someday, eight years from now, when this gets through appeals court, you and me are going to get a fat check in the mail. It'll be fun. Yeah. But uh, no, like. We, this is and this is why it's important. This is why I bring this up. When you figure out who's willing to shell out hard-earned cash like this, and who isn't to watch their football team play, more often than not, it comes down to who has a quarterback and who doesn't. The Buffalo Bills lived through like Bills fans my age, thirty-nine years old, lived through the drought. That was the prime of our lives. Was the drought. It defined the way that we root for our team, the way we feel about our team, the way we view our what's going on with them. And one of the current, like one of the constant th- through lines was just a lack of a quarterback, a lack of respectable quarterback play. So much so that when I watched Chan Gailey and Ryan Fitzpatrick somehow snooker the New England Patriots into a come from behind victory at the final gun. I was like, I have to get season tickets. Do you know how much they were elf? How much in 2012? I paid $235 for eight games. <laughs> wow. I used to sit uh, and I'll tell you exactly which state I'll, I'll tell you right now. Well, you know that Alf has, had similar quarterback issues. I mean, he's had to watch Jay Fiedler and John Beck. Chad Henney? Yes. <laughs> 2008. Okay. Okay. My seats were in section 126, which is right in the end zone, 
Front row. Okay. First row. They're one hundred and twenty six dollars a seat. For, <laughs> so one thousand two hundred and sixty dollars for yeah. a season. And, and when you think about what that is to be in the end Here's zone. Here's the best part. Here's the best part. You know what my parking pass was? I looked it up as well. How much? It was $10 a game. <laughs> it, it, was, it was $100 for the season. And Do you want to guess what a parking pass in the same lot I used to park in costs now? I'm going to say easily over $60. 100 or 125 Or for the season? I'm talking 60 bucks a game. Yeah, Chris. Uh, Chris is closest. Yeah, okay. It's a hundred and seventy-five dollars a game. <laughs> now, and this is where you. And the thing is, you can't. And, and that's for the privilege of parking in a square patch of grass, and then you have some pavement where you could, uh, you know, so you don't set fire to every car in the in the parking lot. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So they put like a little pavement where you drive up, and then like they put the cars like in these little grass patches. And then you tailgate, you put your grill on there. You know, like that one yeah. guy set fire to like eight cars outside of your state <laughs> one day? Yeah, because that fucking idiot, as it turns out, was doing that in the new auxiliary parking lot, which is all grass. <laughs> eight cars run. Imagine you watch the Dolphins lose and then you come out and find out that some other moron burned your car. Yeah, <laughs> like they that, won today. The yeah. They actually won that game, too. They beat the Patriots. Fair enough. I guess my point is, is that you don't get to charge a premium compared to what you used to pay if you don't have a quarterback, by and large. Like, that's it. Your team is successful and you can sell your team when you have a quarterback. And when you don't have one, it's a hard road to hoe. It really is. Hey, but sports, man, but sports are are ridiculous. I got all I got all jazzed for game seven. And I tell my wife, we're going to fucking game seven. I don't give a fuck. Okay. You Game know? seven, Vegas, have, just to give the listeners context. Selling, and Got, we have to start selling shit. We're going to start doing that. He's saying Game seven, Florida Panthers, his hockey team are about to go contend and win a cup at home. Right. And, I'm, and, I, and I tell my wife, I don't give a shit. We're going to start. Sell, we'll, we'll start selling stuff if we have to. I looked at the price. <laughs> Bad seats were two thousand six hundred dollars each. And you know, I got my wife and my daughter, so we're talking about uh, a, like a, a used car to go watch a hockey game. I'm like, you know what? We'll watch it from my house. <laughs> we'll watch it at home and just party really hard. It'll be great. We'll order something awesome. Yeah. So, with that said, this week the Dolphins extended quarterback to a tongue of a low. We talked about it. We always joked about it off air. Like when this happens, it's going to break the internet. And luckily. Jordan Love signed his contract right after, which wasn't a mistake. His his agent was basically like, hey, we're not signing with you. Green. We know that Green Bay wants us. We're going to hold out until two assigns so that we can get one up. And we can be the top dog, richest quarterback, get all the headlines. But even so. They were the same agency, by the way. And I got some insight on those contracts yeah. some numbers if you want to if you want to hear them. well so this is it so you guys have extended to and first of all just from a fan perspective you've got to be happy that you at least have a future do you at least oh, have the plan for a future yeah it was a celebratory mood and the same 11 dickheads on the internet were were the same 11 dickheads <laughs> the day before yep okay and yeah it was it was Pretty exciting day, really. Uh, pretty good day down here, and that presser was something else. Uh, it was fe- it was almost festive. And when Tua came up to to the crowd and and, and screaming to the mic, "Show me the money!" That crowd went absolutely ballistic. So yeah, and then his first pass in practice is a seventy yard touchdown to Tyreek Hill. <laughs> yeah, you know it was it was it was a great day, really, and. The contract, you know, wasn't what I expected. I, I thought it was a little lower, but, you know, it was more than Herbert. And that's all I wanted to hear. <laughs> you you like the fact that they value him more than Herbert? I know that. I also, I also like the fact that all these Herbert stands, or like I like to call them the perverts. <laughs> okay. Uh, I like that all these perverts have been telling me, ah, oh, line up 10 GMs and ask them who they want. Well, guess what? The NFL players just voted on their top 100. And Tua was number 36 in the NFL, and your guy was 75. So <laughs> take that, Herbert. Now, here's 
what I'll say for those of you listening to this who don't understand the acrimony. The Herbert Tua debate has raged ever since that draft. And you have your contingent of Dolphins fans who have complained saying, we drafted the wrong guy. And then you've got the contingent of Chargers fans who go, well, our guy doesn't have any playoff wins, but neither does yours, and our guy's better. Even though neither of them have contended for the division or at least won it yet. The Dolphins are actually the more successful of the two franchises. If you look at win loss, you look at the quality of the offense they put in the field. So it's just a funny thing to watch two franchises from a distance as a Bills fan to watch. Yeah, two and, f- and, and then it's also, you know, <laughs> yin and yang, because one guy, Herbert, was really, really good the first two years, much better. And then the last two years, Tua has been much better. So when you get into a, a conversation with any Herbert anywhere, they're going to tell you the same thing. Oh, look at these first two years. Record setting. And I'm like, yeah, Dan Marino was awesome in 84 and 85, too. You want to compare that? You know, how about we compare 2022 and 2023? You know, the la- or 2023 and 2024? How about the last few years that they've played? Who's been better? It's just, it's funny because two is such a polarizing player. And now he's your guy. And so I want to break into this a little bit. First of all, the nuts and bolts of the contract are really interesting. If you can talk a little bit about the structure, because we had postulated, and I'm, I'm looking at some of the numbers here on Spotrack, but to, to help kind of make it make sense, this giant structure, like the giant extension has a sort of unique structure, just in the way that they kind of got his cap hit to make sense for the team, right? Mm-hmm. So why don't you expand yeah. on that a little bit? Yeah, they, they decided that they wanted to, and and I, I talked about this uh, at length, that the holdup was probably the structure, that they wanted something similar to what uh, Jalen Hurts got, and the two people probably wanted something similar to what Jared Goff got. Now, the numbers really don't matter, right? 53.1 APY, all of that is funny money. All that is phony baloney. Like the actual money, you got to remember, Jordan Love and Tua Tungvaloa have the same agent. So it stands to reason that they were negotiating the, these deals side by side, right? And if you look at the numbers dollar for dollar, okay, and then you take the Wisconsin state income tax into, into, you know, in, into account, and you and you do it just, you know, you, you do a calculation based on his eight or nine home games in Wisconsin and what he's going to pay in taxes and compare it to Tua's eight or nine home games that he's going to play in my pay in my play in Miami or Florida and not pay any state income taxes. The tax bill difference is eight point four million dollars. Right. Jordan Love got two hundred and twenty total. And I'm talking about for the four years It's eight point four million dollars. Jordan Love got 220 total. Tua got 212.4 total. So they have the same exact contract. That's but adjusted for taxes. And that's interesting. Like, Chris, this, this, this is the inside baseball that I don't know about other people, but I get off on. Like, one agent negotiating two deals and you see how close they are. It makes it, it makes you- a lot of sense in, in the way of hockey, Elf. I know that you... You follow the sport because your Panthers just won the goddamn cup. <laughs> you t- you take a look at what uh, Willie Nylander signed in Toronto. It's like he signed for like eleven and a half million versus somebody like Sam Reinhart who got paid way less, and you could clearly see that's adjusted for taxes. Yeah, I had a I had a Sabres fan in my DMs telling me we're gonna take them back from you for thirteen million a year, and I'm like, good luck. Okay. You're the you're the du- first of all, you're the dumbest you're the dumbest GM on earth if you do that. Uh, like this is it, and so fans, I want to get into this. So you guys have Tua; he's cemented now as your quarterback for the foreseeable future. Good for you. It's the first time you've given out a meaningful quarterback extension since when? Uh, Ryan Tannehill. <laughs> and how'd that go? Of all people. And how'd that go? No, uh, it didn't go good. <laughs> he uh, got traded within the first couple of years. Of it. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, <laughs> he played one year under that contract. Year two, he was he was actually pretty good. Year two, he just got injured. Then year three, he blew out his uh, his knee in training camp, and then we had the Jay Cutler experience. Experience, and then the following year, we just we sent him packing. 
So that was a disaster. So realistically, you're kind of like you're someone that Bills fans can actually commiserate with when we talk about all of these failed quarterback experiments. And then the elation you feel when you finally get one who you're like, hey, I don't give a shit if you think he's perfect. He does the things that we need to do to win a lot of football games and make us relevant again. So I'll take it. You know, you get the Kansas City Chiefs fans who pile on Bills fans going, oh, you guys gave us Mahomes. We did. That stings. It'll still hurt. It'll hurt forever. I'll I'll never get over this. But I'll stuff it down with a healthy portion of Josh Allen railroading the Chiefs in the regular season, jumping over defenders and winning AFC's titles. I'll, I'll, I'll find a way to survive. It's the same thing for Dolphins fans. When everyone goes, oh, Tua, he's injury prone. He's not that good. He's not clutch. And you go, yeah, but at least I know that he's the guy. Like, if we're looking at the outlook, the pros and the cons of it, there are cons. Let's not pretend that there aren't. There are some things that, that you'd like to clean up. There's some things that he can't control in terms of the health issues. But I think last year he proved that at least when kept upright, <laughs> when the offensive line isn't a sieve all of the time and he's not taking hits by the tens and the twenties, he can actually stay healthy for a full slate of games and give you a really competent NFL offense for the first three quarters of the season down the stretch. You guys fall apart, but I don't think that's as much on him. Like I'd argue some of it's him. I think some of it's McDaniels. Am I right or wrong? Mother nature. Uh, you're right on both counts, but okay. it's also uh, injury. Uh, sure. Last year was, was a disaster. And Mother Nature, uh, I think that's a little bit overstated, and, and I'll tell you why. He's played two real cold games. That's it. Because I don't consider under 45 degrees cold. I consider under 32 degrees cold. And the problem is you played one of them in Buffalo in a game where I'm so sick. Like, literally, I got hit with the flu. During yeah, he's tailgate. played like the people that say, oh, two is not good in the cold. He's played two games in the cold. One in Buffalo, he played well. And Josh Allen, Josh Allen. Yeah, Dolphins. well, that was it. I'm, I'm literally falling asleep like an owl, chin and chest. Like Chris didn't believe I was sick. I lost my voice by the time the game started. Before we even started yelling, my voice was gone. And he's like, what's wrong with you? I'm raspy. Yeah, it was actually that night. It was actually pretty cold here in Miami. I was grilling outside. and <laughs> I was grilling outside. <laughs> Yeah, but it was pretty cold, man. It was like it was like a, you know, it was like chilly, forty eight degrees or something like that. I'm all bundled up, chin and chest. I fall yeah. asleep. That's how sick I am. And I we, fall we were we were we were like staring at each other, like we we're about to beat the Bills in their place in a snowstorm. Like this is pretty cool. And I fall asleep, and I wake up because the whole crowd is going ape shit. It's because Josh Allen just took off for like a fifty yard run. <laughs> He's just like, nah, I got this. I'm going to turn this game around right now. And so, well, Tua doesn't have that dynamic to his game. That doesn't mean that he's not a serviceable or better than serviceable quarterback in the NFL. So will you hear a lot of this? Like opposing fans are going to opposing fan. You have a couple people you'd like to pick a, pick a bone with. Well, <laughs> the Bills backers of Rochester. Yeah, whoever that guy is, can you find him? Get his at, because I'm not going to look him up now. <laughs> but but that shit bag is in my timeline every <laughs> single day, okay? With one troll after the other. And Jesus Christ, man, do you don't have anything else better to do? Also, I saw you Are get you just in an idiot at this point. Oh, sure. There, oh, no, there's a ton of them. And I'll tell you what, I will get his information for you because I love this. Nothing, nothing makes me f happier than a good beef. I like this. Also, you tweeted out something with the Batman rubbing his chin thing, and a guy we know, Hansel from Cover One, was like, let's see the math. And obviously, you interact. You took the bait. You have to let these guys go, Elf. You can't fight everybody. You can't. Well, look, I'm going to try. Look, I, that guy, I actually like him. He's really, really smart. He's smart. Okay. But his posts on this are not smart. <laughs> they're they're borderline idiotic okay look josh allen's great I, I put out my own little quarterback list why because it gets clicks not because <laughs> it matters but you know people click on it and then if they click on it they might search my bio and if they search my bio if they're a dolphin fan they'll click on all my crap and if they click on all my crap they put money in my bank account there it is oh, see that's how it was. okay 
So I put out a quarterback list. I have Josh Allen as my second best quarterback. I think he's the – for a very brief moment in time, I moved up Joe Burrow to number two, and I put Josh Allen to number three, but then I moved him right back because Joe Burrow is falling apart, and now he has that weird haircut. There's no way he's going to be like that. <laughs> You look okay. like Eminem. You can't be my. You can't be cute. Yeah, you can't be good. Yeah, you do that. You can't be good. Just like when Tua was changing his hair, I was like, you know what? <laughs> Get back to that little short haircut you had. That look, you look better with that thing. You know, good thing he's done that, and he and he grew the beard out. Tua was not looking good without no beard. <laughs> okay, you know, like I were not giving him the two hundred and twelve million dollars if he didn't have the beard. As soon as he got the beard, I'm like, okay, quit giving the money. But uh. I'm arguing with this guy, and he keeps doing this over and over again. He's And he's put this tweet out a bunch of times. Oh, you call Josh Allen turnover prone? Two is just as turnover prone as, as Josh Allen is. And I'm trying to explain to this idiot, because that's what he is, if he's going to continue to insist on this and then try to back it up with math. Look, there's hard numbers. There's ways that you could get to this. There's a thing called an, a snap in the NFL, which means it's a play from scrimmage which means that it's a live play, which means that's the only time you could get a turnover, okay? You could get one on downs, but th- that's not charged to your quarterback. So when you snap the ball through the center's legs to the quarterback and he touches it and he either hands it off or drops it, and that's that's charged to the, the quarterback, and, or he drops back and he throws the ball, that's an interception, okay? We got that so far, right? Yep. I'm picking, up what you're, I'm picking up what you're putting down. Okay. Of these things called snaps, Josh Allen has 6,090 of them in his career. He has 102 turnovers. So you can you could figure out how many turnovers he averages per snap, and also you could get the average per snap per game that the Bills have played in the last, what is it, six years, and you could figure out how many how many turnovers he has per game. He has more than Tua. He has a lot more than Tua, period. It doesn't mean that Tua is better than him. It just means that he turns the ball over more than him. That's you're, it. You're, so we made this We made this uh, observation the other night during the show where we were talking about how everyone banging on Josh, they go, oh, he's turnover prone. We had this conversation. We said, look, well, I, if you, I, I, but, I but if you look at plus, minus, yes. and touchdowns. Yeah. Plus, yeah, minus, hold and on, touchdowns. Hold on. Let, let, me, let me interrupt you here. Yep. Josh Allen is turnover prone. Sure. But he's also touchdown prone and win prone. That's it. So here's what happens. He's plus 99 touchdowns since 2021. If you factor in turnovers and everything else, he's plus 99, which is first in the NFL. Patrick Mahomes is behind him at 97. If he ever cut down on those turnovers, it would be like Thanos snapping his fingers and he would turn everyone to dust. And that's right. But you, but you can't because that's part of the game. That's, that's why part he gets of the, the game. Touchdowns. That's why he gets the touchdowns is he has that Brett Favre thing of, my balls are huge, and I think I can throw this ball. I think I can I can risk standing in the pocket for X number of seconds beyond what is reasonable. And I can just pivot and dance and do whatever, and maybe someone will hit it. Maybe I'll fumble this ball. You know what's funny? He doesn't fumble the ball while he's running very often. It's usually when he's in the pocket. That's where all of his fumbles have come from. So it's just funny how we all like to, like, everyone becomes very tribal when it comes to this conversation. That's the whole idea of the AFC's roundup is to start to see things more globally and just broaden our horizons a little bit. So I think that what you can do as a fan, especially a Bills fan, is you can realize that you can live in both worlds. You can sit here as a Bills fan and cheer for this signing and go, because I heard everyone going, that's the weirdest cope where you're like, oh, all these opponent fans are going, well, we beat them the last time we played them. It's very reasonable as a Bills fan to sit here and say they just paid a quarterback a ton of money who's one in six against us. You can see how you could get there as a fan. If you're not looking at the statistics and you don't care about analytics, you just care about wins and losses and what goes on on TV. It's easy to find your way there. It's also fair to say that if you are a Dolphins fan, you can be excited about this signing because... Your NFL was the, you were the number one offense in the NFL. The number one offense in the NFL in a top five unit last year with that quarterback. And half the people who are throwing shade at you come from Pittsburgh, 
the LA Chargers fan base, and Jacksonville. And those dickheads can't say anything because when did they ever compete on offense? When have they, when have they ever been relevant at the top of the NFL in terms of offensive production? Yeah, it's also, and also, you know, I've, I've, you know, and we've stated that was our mission with our podcast that we wanted to inform, you know, yeah. and obviously we failed. Yeah. <laughs> we failed. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, people just don't understand the salary cap. Like there were some Steeler fans yesterday. I was getting a kick out of these. And I was like, I was like this close to the to the keyboard. And I was like, you know what? Just forget it. You no, know? you just let like, the- I explain it to these people. You know I what saw I'm saying? T- I saw a tweet the other day. It was about Jets fans, but I think it applies to a lot of these like used to be like used to have gravitas and no longer do fan bases or like teams Yeah, where they're like at some point we need to normalize treating them like the ho- like the homeless guy who's screaming at cars and traffic, but your windows are closed. You see them yeah. and I you tried acknowledge that they the exist Steeler. and then you just keep the- driving. <laughs> Yeah, I tried to explain to the Steeler fans that they are now the team that we beat by a touchdown and we spend the whole week bitching about why our team sucks. Yes, that's it. And those guys will never understand. And so in that way, you guys with this signing have cemented the fact that at least with this coaching staff and this system, for however long that lasts, you guys have the bones of what can be a very, very potent passing offense in the NFL. If nothing else, you have that, and that'll do more for you on Sundays than a lot of what the AFC is currently trotting out. And so in that way, now that we've kind of talked through your own reaction to this signing, I think it's interesting to start to handicap the futures of each AFC team, AFC's team, at the quarterback position. Let's start with who's in last place and why. And are you going to be shocked, Elf, if I start with the New York Jets? <laughs> Would Are you shocked if I say that they're a team whose quarterback position is a dumpster fire because they have yeah. no future? Well, I think that there's one thing you have to monitor, okay? You have to monitor what happens in Dallas because Dallas is pretty stupid, okay? <laughs> but a little birdie, a little birdie has – Dallas a little is birdie, pretty dumb is telling me that they're going to pay C.D. Lamb a pile of money, okay? Why would you pay C.D. Lamb a pile of money? And I know he's great. If you're not going to give him a quarterback, right? So it stands to reason they're going to they're gonna sign Dak Prescott. Remember, they can't franchise tag him, right? Mm-hmm. So this is where it can get a little funky for a couple of seasons. I happen to like Dak Prescott a lot, okay? Uh, that's why I laugh. Sometimes I just got to log off of Twitter because these are just stupid people. Okay. People try to insult me by saying Tua is in the Dak Prescott, Jared Goff, uh, tier. Did those quarterbacks I'm, not lead some of the best <laughs> offenses during the regular season? Over the- <laughs> and I'm like, you understand, you just mentioned two. And if, since you're lumping in Tua, you just mentioned the guy who ran the three guys who ran the top three offenses in the NFL. It's it's embarrassing if you try to apply logic to anything on social media. That's the so problem. that's you, where it can you get have a little, to suspend like, logic. Does that make you a like? Let me ask you, as a Bills fan, does that make you just a little bit queasy that the Cowboys do something stupid and the Jets sign Dak Prescott next year? <sighs> Not really, because they're still the Jets. Like most of coaching, here's the thing, and you can, in your experience, you can probably back this up. Offense is your offensive line, it's your quarterback, and it's your coordinator before it's your skill players. If you have those things in lockstep, you're pretty unstoppable, and the Chiefs have proved that. Now, you go out and you sign whoever the fuck at quarterback. You could be the Jets getting Brett Favre all over again. It won't matter if everything around him, including the coaching, is mediocre to dog shit. It won't. Make a difference. So with that in mind, unless they're going to fire the whole staff, bring in Dak Prescott, and then go hire the hottest coaches on the cycle, I don't care. Bring in whoever you want for quarterback for the Jets. I think that if you go get any current could-be free agent quarterback, I still don't think it makes them contenders. I think it might make them better, but I don't think it's good enough. 
And so when we talk about for this exercise, who's going to put asses in seats year over year over year? There's no plan in New Jersey. There isn't one. They have a they have an aging future first ballot Hall of Famer who they put all their chips in that basket that will win a championship with this guy right he's now. Crack, by the way. Yeah, well, he's on he's on a lot of things. He's doing a lot of wild shit. And now you're gonna look at the future and go, okay, but what comes next? Because we traded away our former second overall pick. Who do we have under contract two years from now at quarterback? There's nobody. And they're still dealing with his contract if he retires. So they're going to carry his dead cap hits, which is going to prevent them from spending as much as they might want to. I'm pretty sure if he retires in the next year or so, like if he at the end of next season goes, man, you know what? I can't compete. This team's not going anywhere. I'm done. They're going to wear that at least for two years. So who are they going to get, Elf? I think that the light is the dimmest for the New York Jets in terms of not only current quarterback situation, but also for the future. Well, they have their own first-round pick next year. Wouldn't it be the most Jets thing ever if they go 10-7, and miss the playoffs, (laughs) end up picking – 18th, and they can't get any of those quarterbacks? Well, it would be funny if they're doing the things that the Bills used to do during the drought, where you're 9-7, 10-win year. team, and now you miss out on all the great prospects because yeah. you're just mediocre enough to miss on them. <laughs> yeah, this is a big year, though. This, this is a big year that's coming up. There's going to be like four or five pretty decent quarterbacks coming out in this draft. So you're going to want one of those if you need one. Then so there's, that, like, there's kind of a drought until the Manning kid comes along. So then you kick it up a notch and you go, okay, what about third place? Obviously, the New England Patriots. Because Jacoby Brissett is going to take day one starting snaps. They said so themselves. They were like, well, Jacoby's our starter until Drake May proves himself. It's not – I don't take that as a knock against Drake May. As much as I say, this is a young coaching staff that does not want to go out there and show its ass. <laughs> yeah, they're they're in preserve. Look, they just they sat in a room, all right, Gerard Mayo and the whole crew, and they said they looked at each other and they said, "We're gonna suck, aren't we? <laughs> like we're bad. Like we're gonna be a bad football. Like we could legitimately fire off fifteen <laughs> losses right here, right?" And then they said, we're not going to throw the kid out there to get smoked. And then maybe Bob Kraft says, you know what? I'm shit canning all of these people. Yeah. Well, what? Well, you know what I mean? This is it. We're going to preserve. We're going to preserve the sweetener. Like, hey, Bob, you know, you, you know, you know who's starting next year, right? Well, kid. this is the thing is you you find out how involved in the draft process the Krafts really were. And then you find out like, oh, well, they liked this guy. And so the new Elliot Wolf, who's not really a GM, but he is the GM, but he doesn't have the he has title a great of name, GM. Though. He has a like, great name. Yeah, Wolf Blitzer is better. Like I can think of a bunch of different better. I can think of a better. Uh, but, but if you're if you're an Wolf. NFL GM and your last name is Wolf, he's related, right? To to the old man, right? I believe so. Okay. Here's what I know. You do yourself a lot of favors by buying more runway. Right. That's what GMing is all about is how much runway. Now that I'm in the pilot seat, how much runway can I give myself? Because <laughs> if I'm not winning Super Bowls, I need to keep putting runway out there so that I can find my way to get off the ground. Get that. Because w- once you get a ring as a GM, as a coach, you get more runway by default. You're not going to, they're not going to fire you unless you're in Philly because you're just like, you're important to the fabric of the fan base, the community. You're a thing. Philly is the only place on earth where you can be Doug Peterson and win the Super Bowl and get fired two years later because it's Philly. Those people hate everything. <laughs> Otherwise, if you're in New England, the ownership is involved in the scouting of this player. You draft that player. You pick him to be your next signal caller. If you get him killed, you're going to get killed. If you put Drake May behind an understructured and undermanned offense 
and he gets slaughtered like uh, I'm thinking, what's his name for the Houston Texans? David Carr. David Carr. <laughs> if you give him the David Carr treatment, that guy will kill you as a coach because that was his guy. You brought him into the process. You helped him scout that guy. Now he fell in love. And if you hurt that guy, he'll hurt you. <laughs> like that's you know that I'm right. So now I look at this and I go, what is their future? Their future might be bright, but their present kind of sucks because Jacoby Brissett's going to be the guy who is your starter barring injury week one. Mm. Isn't that a hell of a thing? I mean, it's not quite Nathan Peterman starting for the Buffalo Bills week one against the Ravens and Josh Allen backing him up, but it's close. Like, do you under, do, do you know the reference? Yes. Yes, okay. I do. That we benched him at fucking halftime and put Josh Allen out there. We're like, that wasn't the plan, but now you're the guy. Fuck it, Peterman, you're fired. You're you're, you're fired to the back of the quarterback depth chart. I think that New England now lives in that place. And that's okay because maybe Drake May, Chris, you've, you've talked about your thoughts about Drake May and how you think he could be good. I like Drake May. He likes him. Now, Elf, but I have I have no football acumen. I'm only saying that because of a couple of North Carolina games where <laughs> I won money betting on college football. Elf, you as a guy who loves the draft, what do you think about Drake May and the upshot he gives the Patriots in the future? Uh, I'm suspicious of it, but I can see how he can be very good. But he's one of those jury is way out type of guys. Uh, and it's, and it's not that there's anything wrong with him, you know, physically or how he played the game in North Carolina. It's just, uh, some aesthetic things like his delivery, his setup to throw, to throw to, especially outside the numbers and, and his propensity to drop his head inside the numbers, which makes you condense the field has guys driving on the football. You're going to notice that if he plays this year, or if you watch him in the, and watch him in the preseason. You're going to see how he's going to have a very hard time throwing in between the numbers, and he's going to look like a Greek god throwing outside the numbers. And that's because when he's throwing outside the numbers, he could step into it, and when he's throwing inside the numbers, he's aiming it or he's shot-putting it with his arm because he can because he has a big arm. So he needs seasoning. Out of all the quarterbacks that were coming out, he needs some seasoning. So the the Patriots have upshot. But, but he could be good. He could be really, really good. Uh, sure. That's, that's a possibility. But will the New England Patriots have a quarterback who throws for 3,800 yards or more? Uh, this season, no. No. <laughs> not at all. So in no. which case, they're not a threat to either one of us, are they? No. And then that brings us to the Miami Dolphins, who I have second. And I have them second, and here's why. At least you guys know what you want. You know what you like, and you know the system, and you know that this guy can work it. Now, Chris, Chris, can you under can you explain the uh, Tan Marino reference you made earlier? Oh yeah, I got a text message from my best friend, my childhood best friend, texted me yesterday at six o'clock. Just saw Tua called Tan Marino, and now he will never be anything else. <laughs> There you go. Tan Marino. It's it is funny, but it's also interesting because you think about Dan Marino, this quarterback with all the talent in the world and yet didn't win a lot of the big games. Right. Like he he made it one Super Bowl, didn't win it, never made it back. Bunch of playoff losses across the board, like which, hey, listen, at least he made them. I'm not. Yeah, he played in. He played in three <laughs> AFC Championship games. Yeah, and and he went one and two. Yeah. So it's understandable to make a correlation to like, hey, here's a quarterback who's really, really talented and can make our offense this special thing, and then can't get it done in these very specific pivotal games. I get how some Dolphins fans, not even just Bills fans, who are trying to be snarky, but Dolphins fans could make a thing out of that. What I'll say is that you guys now have at least cemented something for yourselves. You know the guy who's going to be throwing the football. You know what his proclivities are, so you can draft players who fit that. 
you can now say, hey, I'm going to go out in free agency and sell that we have continuity at quarterback, and we think you're the right guy to fit his skill set. And we can sell that concept to mid-level free agents and get them to sign here for less, either less than market rate, or we can get you to sign here on a one-year deal if you're trying to rehab your image because we can sell you on the concept that your physical skill set matches what he does, and not for nothing – He's quarterbacked the number one offense in the NFL before. Yeah, yeah. And when he was the quarterback in 2022, they were the number two offense. So, yeah, you know, that, that and that tells you the drop off. Yes. He missed five games. And in those five games, it managed to drop the offense from number two to number six in the <laughs> NFL. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. So that tells you all you need to know. So the evidence is Mike McDaniel shows up. Tua is the quarterback. Number two offense, number one offense. Also coincided with Tyreek Hill, and he makes a huge difference. Yep. Okay? So it's like a package deal. But also – And you're right. They're attracting a lot of one-year deals. Like Odell Beckham is here on essentially nothing, and Calais Campbell signed for the league minimum. This is it. And you don't get that because I'll tell you what. Everyone says, oh, well, money talks. We as Bills fans know that there are a lot of players who have come to Buffalo because Josh Allen's here. Von Miller wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Josh Allen. There were other teams offering him competitive offers. He came here because of Josh Allen. That's what having a well-known, in the NFL community, a well-known quarterback who people think positively of can do for you. You said it earlier, NFL's top 100. It's not us as fans. It's not you know, polarizing media pundits who get to have their say. This is the players ranking each other in how they see the hierarchy of who's talented and who's not. So there's no hot takery. It's just players ranking players. And the fact that Tua was put that much higher than Justin Herbert. (laughs) And higher than Lawrence, who got paid. And slightly higher than Burrow as well, you know. But, but it's also fresh in the minds of these players that Burrow's been really injured the last two years. Yes. You know? And so that's it. Like, that's, that's, it's, it's always, always, any list is always subjective. But yeah. It's, it's always like the last 18 months that anybody cares about. But it's notable that that's from players. And players say, hey, this Tua guy, we think he's a top 40 player in the NFL. And yet you'll have the, the people that you can't ignore. The dickheads on the internet going, uh, uh, to a stinks, and here's here's some weird math to prove why. And you take the bait every time. <laughs> and I love you for it because you're like me. You're petty and you're vindictive. I love Absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I had one guy invite me on his show. And he's like, oh, you're a pretty nice guy, man. Uh, I thought, you know, you're, you're really intimidating on, online. And I'm like. If you really think that that's my real persona in life, then you must think I have like bodies buried in my in my backyard or something. <laughs> you know, that's it. It's like, guys, I barely find time to. I like bar- had people come over to me at camp and shake my hand and go, "You're Alf, right? Oh, I love your content, man. I love all the shit you give people on uh, on Twitter. I get a kick out of it." And I'm like, "Well, well thanks, man. Thanks. I'm an asshole on the internet. Woo! Yeah." It's not hard. It's not hard. All you have to have is a little intelligence and some thumbs that work. You can be a giant dickhead on the internet. What I'll say is that the Buffalo Bills, I'm not trying to be self-congratulatory, but I have to rate them number one. And here's why. Not only have we won the division for four years in a row, we have Josh Allen, who is perennially ranked in the top 10 of all NFL players, even by the players themselves, as we were just talking about. And then there's this. I saw a tweet the other day. This is July 23rd from Josh DeBow from the Associated Press, who has no Buffalo Bills association at all. He says the Bills have gone 40 straight regular season games without a loss by more than six points. That's tied for the longest streak in NFL history with the Packers from 2009 to 2012. That streak coincides with the fact that we drafted and cultivated a Josh Allen who then cultivated himself and just turned it loose on everybody. Like, we didn't do anything special. We drafted a quarterback who was a major project, and his first year was not a good thrower of the football. His second year, he wasn't a great thrower of the football. 
And then he put the work in to change his mechanics and he exploded on everybody. Nobody saw 2020 Josh Allen coming and he looked never looked back. And so when I think about what the future looks like for us, we have this guy in his prime right now. He's not going anywhere. We're going to extend him. And so we're going to get the Ben Roethlisberger thing of like, hey, this guy's going to be here and he'll be a lesser version of himself when he turns 30. <laughs> He's going to not elf. How old are you? 50. You're 50. Jesus Christ. You look good for 50. I'm 39. I just threw my lower back out trying to change my pool filter valve. <laughs> like it was yeah, awful. No, I'm 50. I've been yeah, limping. I'm, I'm all of 50. I literally have to go get spinal decompression on Wednesday <laughs> just to wow. fix the I've been I've been hobbling. Sitting here upright in this chair for the last few hours has been brutal. My lower back is screaming at me right now. This guy is a maniac. And eventually that will subside. And you're already starting to see, though, like he's becoming more of a pocket passer and he's still like cultivating that passing game. That's going to be the thing that survives when his legs fail him. Somewhere in there, we have to hope that he does the uh, John Elway thing where he goes and wins a Super Bowl or two. (laughs) Well, he's still got the mobility and the arm. But he's got ru- so much runway because he not only has the arm, but he also has the physicality now and the, the running game and everything else. Our outlook is great because we're the team that keeps winning the division literally just on the back of this one guy who seems, Elf, to your frustration, takes over every pivotal game. When it comes down to who's going to wrestle the division away from who and the Dolphins fans are feeling so good about it and you're feeling good about it. And then Josh Allen, Josh Allen's. Mm -hmm. We're going to have that guy in his prime for years. And that gives us a lot more runway than I think any other franchise in the AFC East has right now. And as a Dolphins fan, can you at least acknowledge that and agree with me? Well, I have him as the second best quarterback in the NFL. There we go. I would hope so, right? (laughs) There we go. Yeah. That's another thing that bothers me. Like, you know, the the Bills fans that want to start arguing, you know what? We're done arguing about, you know, Tua Tungvalu with Dolphin fans. We're going to go after the Chiefs fans now. <laughs> and we're going to say that Josh Allen's better than Patrick Mahomes. Don't that's punch, where I say don't slow punch, down. Don't punch above your weight class, kid. Stay here. Yeah, slow down. Stay here where it's safe. Stay where you're at. You know what I mean? <laughs> where you're at is pretty good. Why don't you go argue with the Ravens fans, you know? Yeah. Like, you you, you can win that here? argument. Argue with the, the Bengals fans. I don't know if you know this, but years ago, Bill Barnwell, and us got into it on Twitter. And I the whole thing was him saying that the Bills would be a better Super Bowl contender if they had Lamar Jackson than if they had Josh Allen. So the funny thing is, I know he doesn't do his own homework. He's got a team of interns who are just doing all of his numbers for him. And so what I did was I started tweeting at him, not ever thinking he'd respond. And I started showing him my homework. You know how Hansel approached you and was like, let's go, let's, let's show the math. Well, I did my numbers. And what I did was I showed every target he had to anybody who wasn't a tight end. I'm like, this is how this guy uses wide receivers. This is how Josh Allen uses wide receivers. One of these things is sustainable. One of them isn't, especially when it comes playoff time. When you play good teams that have good safeties and linebackers, why do you think that the Ravens wilt in the playoffs? Because you run into teams in the playoffs who have good linebacker play, good safety play. Lamar Jackson is really good and always has been at utilizing tight ends. He really struggles up until last year. Now the new offensive coordinator helped getting his wide receivers more involved. And even that wasn't enough to get them through the AFC title game. At home, with all of the advantages, they still couldn't make it happen. Yeah, that's one of my favorite ones. They dinged Tua for scoring seven points in minus 30-degree weather in Kansas City to the Kansas City Chiefs, (laughs) while Lamar Jackson scored 10 points at home (laughs) in 52-degree weather against the Kansas City Chiefs. It's it's because everybody picks a narrative and just marries themselves to it. How about Tua goes to Baltimore to play Kansas City? All right? How Mm -hmm. about that? In 52-degree weather. And let's see if he could score more than 10 points. And that's where I just – I look at all this and I say, there's there's class, there's levels to this. 
but at the same time, the conversation remains the same. There, there is a hierarchy of who's good, who's better, and ultimately, both of our teams are on the right side of the coin when it comes to the AFC East. I feel like we are in a position. Chris, I know you love this. If you want to get behind the mic real quick and speak to this before we close this thing out. You loved football when it was the Bills and Dolphins having a real rivalry back and forth, which you can't have a rivalry. It's like people talk about the Chiefs and Bills rivalry. How can it be a rivalry if we are just constantly pissing away every single playoff performance against them? You have to win the pivotal games, the games that mean something for both teams. You have to win those in order for it to be a rivalry. There has to be a back and forth. We have that now with the Dolphins. There's a, there's, a, there's a thing of Drew and I being the same age. Drew and I are, are a little over a year, a year apart. I did, just turned 40 last week. So there's images of me of that I can remember as a, I must have been seven or eight years old. You would Alf being fifty, you would have a better understanding of this of Brian Cox walking onto our field, giving us the, With the fin- double mitters. the finger. I have, I have that eight by ten autographed by Brian Cox. That's that's impressive. <laughs> the and it's a thing of also being just being a. a six seven year old child where it's uh, it wasn't that young no, no chris we were i was uh, 12 no, no i'm saying six seven years old mm-hmm. you just get this thing of wow we we go to the super bowl every year <laughs> and in route to the super bowl it entails beating the dolphins <laughs> every year that and my childhood is wrapped. There's never going to be a bigger rival to Buffalo than Miami. New England will never be there. The Jets will never be there. The Jets could get there if they can win a division, and they have not done that in years. They I haven't think done it. Since I think it's only happened once in my lifetime. But for me, it's uh, the Bills and Dolphins. It is the best rivalry that. I can experience being a Bills fan, fan and a Sabres fan. It's I hate Miami. I hate your team so much, <laughs> and it's been ingrained in in me as a, since I was a child from always beating Miami in the playoffs, and then cementing it with the Brian Cox middle finger. Now, Elf, you talk about having that picture signed. And then you had a tweet earlier where you were like, oh, hey, when John o. Smith comes out of the tunnel with double middles flying, it's going to be the coolest thing ever. I'll tell you what. I remember the day that I like I saw it. They were like, because the cameras weren't ready for it. The TV cameras just caught it because they were like, no one comes out of the tunnel with their fingers up. Oh, uh, by the way, I hate to interrupt you, but uh, I, this is one of my favorite memes and one of my favorite trivia <laughs> questions ever. Okay, you ready for it? Yep. All right, the Patriots have the most division titles because you know, of course, they had this twenty-year run of terror, the okay? dynastic run. Okay, Dolphins are second. I'll ask you a simple question: Who's fourth? Who has the fourth most division titles? Oh, it's the Jets. In the AFC East. Oh Do- no, no, this is a trick question. Oh, it's the, the Colts. The answer is the Colts. It's yeah, the, the Colts have the fourth. It's the Colts. <laughs> fourth most the division. And that's fight. what I was going to say is the Jets. I, I was looking at this thing the other day. The Jets' last Super Bowl appearance wasn't – it was only like a year or two after Jim Crow laws were finally phased out. <laughs> you don't get to talk to me if you're from Long Island and you're still repping Jets colors. You suck. Your team sucks. Your quarterback situation is garbage. I'll see you in hell. The Patriots fans, they know how I feel about them. Now – Dolphins fans, that game with Brian Cox, I remember looking at my dad and saying, why would someone arrest that guy? And my dad goes, I don't think you understand how that works, like how free speech works and just like what you could do. In those, let me tell you, those were weird. That was a weird rivalry in those days <laughs> because the Dolphins would manage to go to Buffalo in not ideal <clears throat> conditions against a really good football team. And smoke them like 37 10, right? Or win a hard fought battle. And then you guys would return the favor in Miami. We would trade wins 
in <laughs> in different places. It's almost like we hated each other's fan bases so much. So we would go the win players, in each other's place. The players would get fired up and be like, hey, we're going to punk these guys in front of their fans so much so that it manifested itself in wins and losses. Alf, yeah, Alf, and then we would end Alf. up in the playoffs almost always in Buffalo, and Buffalo would win, except for that one AFC championship game when we forgot how to defend a screen. <laughs> Alf, Alf, you know that as a child, it's a regular season moment that is burned in my brain for the rest of my life is I believe Miami had Miami ended up winning the game here in Buffalo. I have burned in my brain 106 yard interception return for a touchdown by Lewis Oliver on Jim Kelly. It's yes. burned into my brain. <laughs> yeah. Lewis Oliver, Lewis Oliver had three interceptions that day and he had the 106 <laughs> yarder and the dolphins won 37 to 10. Yes. <laughs> And this is it. And that was also that was also Keith Jackson's debut. Remember, <laughs> that was the dawn of free agency. Yeah. If you remember how that how that all went down, yes, Keith sir. Jackson essentially sued the NFL. Yep. Saying that the Eagles had breached contract and therefore he was a free agent. Remember? Yep. <clears throat> and and he goes, the, I can sign with whoever I want. For him. And remember, a bunch of teams bid for him, and then all of a sudden he said, Oh, I'll sign with the Dolphins. And <laughs> we were jazz because you know we were Super Bowl contenders and we have Dan Marino. And now we just added Keith Jackson to the mix. If you remember his debut, I think it was his third snap. He catches a pass like at the 15-yard line, breaks a tackle, and then jumps into the end zone to open the scoring in that game. And as soon as I saw that, I said, we found the elixir for the Buffalo Bills. This thing is over. (laughs) We're going to win like five Super Bowls now. (laughs) And sure enough, we won that game 37 to 10. It was a beatdown in Buffalo. It was it was glorious. And then later that year, you guys beat us like 45, 35 in Miami. (laughs) And then, of course, that was the famous year we lost in the AFC championship game. And this is what I'm talking about. You don't get to have these stories and you don't get to this place if you don't have a quarterback. And unfortunately, you and I are the only two representatives. By the way, I hate to interrupt you again, but now since we're roll, strolling down. Yeah, by, now that we're going down know, memory lane. Yeah, we're going down memory lane. It just occurred to me because now I, all these memories of all the different games, Dolphins, Bills, because I looked it up one time. I think that the, the final tally in regular seasons was like 10-8 Buffalo. <laughs> you know that almost none of them? I think it was one game where Jim Kelly dove into the end zone with 14 seconds left to beat us to open the season here in Miami. I'm pretty sure you could remember that. You remember? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know that I think that was the only close game. The rest of them were just trading blowouts back sure. and forth. Because every single time we had a star quarterback, you had a star quarterback, one team would just show up with something new that the other team hadn't seen, and they would fuck them up. And it was, that's what it is to have a star. And you have one. We have one. You know who September does- 10th, 1989, Bills 27-24, Jim yep. Kelly, two-yard rush, two-yard rush to end the game. And we had the last uh, 14 points. There was a, before the Kelly touchdown was a Jim Kelly throwing to Flip Johnson for 26 yards. There, I don't even know who that is. There's a montage on YouTube. If you want to hear, it's called The Best of Van Miller, who was like our longtime play caller on the radio color, like the commentator play by play guy that play is in there, but they sync up his audio with NFL films video. And it's so cool to watch guys. If you're a bills fan, go check that out. But realistically, that was, did you say 1989, right? 1989. Yeah. You and okay, I could uh, sit here and tell stories all night long about the rivalry and the great times. And it I happened- think I think I, I I almost got into a fight outside the <laughs> stadium in in that game. Yeah, it happens because we have had great quarterbacks, and we were the only two teams in the division that mattered. We've r- arrived at that place again. <laughs> we're the only two teams in the division that actually matter. We have great quarterbacks, and we're gonna have them for a while. So we're, they're going to build coaching and schemes and draft picks and everything to fit the style of those two men. And we're going to go out there and wage war against each other. And I don't give a shit about what they're doing in New Jersey. It'll fail like it always fails because it's New Jersey. Ultimately, 
our two franchises are the best set up for the future as we go forward at the quarterback position, which ultimately dictates success. And I'm happy because it's going to give such a, Chris, such a dynamic to these AFC East Roundup podcasts that we're going to do this year. Because I'm sure it's going to be another war of attrition. It's going to be your team, my team, going back and forth. You guys blowing out some shitbag team like the Colt, like the like the Broncos. What the seventy point win, and then you come to Buffalo and lose, and it shocks the world. And it's like no, because they sucked, and then they ran into Josh Allen and the Buffalo Bills, and that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be Clash of the Titans every time they meet. I love it. I love that we get to do this, and I love that we met you as a fellow podcaster we can commiserate with over these things. And the players get it, okay? Like, I don't even li- I don't know if you've been watching NFL Network or... Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't yeah, know yeah. if you've been watching any any of, uh, any of the yeah. videos that, that the Dolphin beat or, or we have put up from three yards per carry, but the players mention it. Like, Tua, when he was asked in, in the press conference, you know, what's the next... You know, what's the next, uh, the next thing you want to do? And he says, well, I want to expand my game. I want to be able to run for a first down, threaten the run when I have to. I want to win playoff games. I want to beat Buffalo. (laughs) I want to beat Buffalo. And I love that. I love that that's on his lips because you know it's what everybody's thinking. And that's a rivalry. That's a rivalry, baby. Even the head coach said it. He said, said, you know, the goal is always to win all the games in the division. But only a split is only acceptable, you know, it's when only... it's against the very best in the division. So he he was shitting on somebody, and I know he's not shitting on the Bills. I love it. Elf, thank you so much for joining us tonight as we kind of talk our way through quarterback extensions and just kind of looking at the quarterback hierarchy, not just now, but also in the future. I love it. I love thinking about it. I love thinking about the the reignition of this rivalry because I, I've just taught my kids how to chant squish the fish. And I love it because that died. It's gone. I like how Jet fans, and who knows, maybe they're right. Maybe this really is going to work for them. But I like how they're pointing to their schedule and they're saying, we could run off nine out of the first ten. And I'm like, you guys don't understand you're the Jets, right? <laughs> you're still the Jets. Like, when the hell was the last time you guys ran nine out of ten of anything? Elf, why don't you tell everybody where they can follow you on social media and where they can follow you on uh, guys on OnlyFans? Well, uh, if you want to become a member of our, our, of our, and God knows why the hell you would want to do that. Hey, listen, Pat Cleary's done it three times under assumed names. <laughs> really? So, so, he, he, so I've, I own $9 of Pat Cleary's money. That's you pretty have $9 cool. $9 of Pat Cleary's money. Uh, so if you want to become a member, it's discord.gg forward slash OnlyFins, and you become a member there for $3 a month. You want to listen to our podcast? It's very simple. We're everywhere. You know, we're, we spread like a fungus. We're the number three yards per carry and you can find us anywhere you get your podcasts and of course the twitter account is at three yards per carry you can find all our stuff there where we sell all our t-shirts look if you really want to hate to if we want to set fire to two shirts we got this design you see it <laughs> the big de- i'm not gonna lie i'd vote for him okay this is our this is our campaign shirt for 2024 <laughs> you know it's our sequel to our miami Tua 2020 shirt okay so you can get that uh, at our store, and you get all the details on our Twitter account. Three yards per carry. Guys, this has been a lot of fun, but for tonight, we got to get the hell out of here. I'm Drew Gear. That's Chris Krueger. That's Alfar Tiaga. And this has been your AFC's Roundup.